Okay, let me, before I come to um, money, uh, raise the uh, prior question, uh, why it is that there is exchange in, in the first place. Um, if we imagine, for instance, that uh, every person would be identical to every other person, uh, like a clone of everyone else. Um, and uh, in addition, that uh, the factor land, that is the nature given resources, uh, are also perfectly identical for every individual, such that every individual finds a tree in front of him and the lake in front of him, and there's no difference uh, whatsoever in this regard. Um, then what we would expect is simply uh, that uh, given that people are identical and that land is identical, that everybody would produce identical quantities of identical goods um, and use them up in the same uh, fashion as everybody else does. And obviously in such a situation there would be not the slightest reason even to think about the possibility of exchange. Why should I exchange one identical good for another identical good? Um, so the first insight I want to emphasize is uh, it is necessary for division of labor uh, to emerge that there exist differences either with regard to labor, that is uh, individuals, uh, or with regard to land, the nature given factors, uh, or both of these um, uh, factors. Um, at that moment when differences exist, um, then it becomes possible that people might come up with the idea how about exchanging one thing uh, for another thing produced by uh, someone else, but this is of course again not necessarily so. Uh, we could still imagine that people would remain in self-sufficient isolation and everybody tries to produce whatever he needs for himself. Um, some sociologists or and psychologists have uh, attempted to explain division of labor um, by postulating some uh, yeah, innate sympathy that people have uh, for others. Um, in, in Adam Smith, for instance, you find the phrase that there exists an instinct to truck and barter and that explains the emergence of division of labor. Um, but uh, it is always better if one can explain a phenomenon uh, with less assumptions rather than with more assumptions. And uh, Mises uh, uh, develops the argument, uh, let's assume that everybody hates everybody else. Um, could we then explain the emergence of division of labor? And he says, yes, we could do that also. Um, because all we need in order to explain the emergence of division of labor and then based on this of a barter economy um, is the assumption of self-interest that every person prefers to have more goods rather than less goods um, and uh, as you know from uh, elementary micro lectures or so uh, there exist two advantages to uh, division of labor one the so-called absolute advantage. One person is good at one thing and another person is good at something else. Uh, and given the fact that time is scarce, that ever, whatever time we spend doing one thing, we can no longer spend doing something else, it is obviously advantageous to specialize in those things in which one is better and the other person specializes in what he is better and uh, then they engage in exchange uh, and the total quantity of goods produced 
uh, will be higher this way uh, than it would be if both people had decided to produce all of the goods on their own. And the second uh, reason, the so-called comparative advantage, uh, that considers the worst case scenario. That is, we have a superior guy who is in all regards more productive and an inferior guy who is in all regards uh, less productive. And the question then arises, does it make sense for these people to engage in division of labor? And again, the answer that was first formulated by uh, David Ricardo, but was applied to nations rather than to individuals. And the great advance that Mises made over this was to apply the argument to the proper level of individuals. The answer is, yes, even under those circumstances, uh, division of labor is beneficial for both parties participating um, in it, uh, provided only that uh, the all-around superior guy uh, specializes in those things in which his superiority is particularly great, and uh, the all-around inferior guy produces those things, specializes in those things, in which his inferiority is comparatively smaller. Again, given the fact that time is scarce, what I spend if I spend doing A, during the time I cannot possibly produce B, again, the overall result will be an increase um, in, uh, in overall production and an increase in wealth of all people participating in it. So under all circumstances, division of labor um, is more productive. And that explains why mankind has given up trying to be uh, isolated and uh, self-sufficient and engages instead uh, in division of labor. Mises also adds, by the way, the very important point that rather than sympathy being the cause of division of labor, um, it is that the sympathy that develops among people is the result of division of labor motivated initially by nothing but self-interest. That is, once you recognize that you are better off participating in division of labor, then you develop sentiments of sympathy towards your fellow man. So we don't have to stipulate there exists sympathy at the outset. Uh, sympathy is rather the result of initially nothing but selfish motives and the recognition that these selfish motives lead to an overall increased uh, well-being. Um, so now we are in, um, in a barter, barter economy uh, in which people produce partly for themselves and partly they produce for the purpose of exchanging their goods for the goods produced by, uh, by others. Um, and uh, we immediately discover that, uh, uh, that there exists a fundamental problem in a barter economy. Because in order to exchange, it must always be the case that I have what you want and you have what I want. That is, a double coincidence of wants must be in existence. Um, if only one of these accidents happens, I have what you want, but you don't have what I want, then obviously an exchange um, is uh, impossible. Now, if we make the assumption that there exists, so to speak, certainty with respect to the future, that is, every person is perfectly capable of predicting what any, any other person desires at any other point in time and how much he's willing to give away in order to acquire such a good, then under conditions of perfect certainty, we can say uh, double coincidences of wants would always be in existence. Nobody will ever encounter any difficulties getting rid of his goods and acquiring in exchange those goods that he wants. However, 
we of course do not live in a world with perfect certainty but in a world that is characterized by uncertainty and in a world that is characterized by uncertainty it can happen that double coincidences are absent that is we are stuck in our uh, attempt to acquire other goods for the goods that we have produced solely for the purpose of exchanging them against something else. Um, what do people do in this situation where they are stuck and cannot immediately directly acquire what they want due to an absence uh, of a double coincidence of once? This is, so to speak, the beginning of the explanation of the emergence of money. Money would not come into existence under conditions of perfect certainty. Uh, uncertainty is the necessary requirement for the emergence of uh, money. Money, the invention of money, so to speak, is the answer to this problem what do we do if we have produced for exchange but we cannot directly acquire what we want for the goods that we have produced for exchange purposes? Now, the explanation how money emerges has initially been given by uh, Karl Menger and then somewhat refined by Ludwig von Mises. And again, it is uh, quite straightforward. The argument goes something like this. Um, all we need initially is to assume that there is one bright person in society who makes a very simple observation. That is to say, uh, he makes the observation that in a barter economy, not all goods that are traded, not all consumer goods and producer goods that are traded in barter, uh, are equally marketable. That is to say, not all goods are e equally frequently used. Some goods are used by many people at many occasions, and other goods uh, are demanded by few people at few occasions. So given this simple observation that goods distinguish, are distinguishable from each other uh, based on their degree of marketability that they have, this first bright person uh, only has to do the following if he is stuck in a situation where he cannot directly acquire what he wishes to acquire. In that case, all he needs to do is to find someone who, has, who is willing to buy what he has to sell uh, and has a good to offer that has a higher degree of marketability than what I have to sell. Uh, let's say I have to sell, uh, I'm selling fish, uh, and there's, and I want pears, um, but uh, uh, the pear owner is not interested in fish. But there is somebody who is selling apples and apples are a significantly more marketable good than fish, then even in the case where I personally happen to be uh, allergic against apples and do not desire apples as consumer good or as a producer good, would still have a motive to exchange my fish for these apples because as the owner of apples, I have then the possibility I have then the possibility uh, of trading my apples more easily for those goods that I want. That is, the advantage of acquiring more marketable goods over less marketable goods is they are more easily resaleable for those things that I really want. This person who has demanded an apple not to be used as a consumer good uh, not to be used as a producer good, but just for the purpose of it is easier to resale apples and get what I want, has demanded the apple to be used as a medium of exchange or as a facilitator 
of exchange. Now, you realize immediately that as soon as a single person has demanded apples for this purpose, rather than to be used as a consumer good or a producer good, the degree of marketability of apples increases further, above and beyond the degree that existed prior. Because there are still all the people who demand apples to be used as consumer goods and producer goods, plus there is now also one person who demands apples on account of uh, uh, their high degree of uh, marketability. Now imagine other people being stuck in the same situation, the next bright guy, so to speak, uh, this, encountering the same uh, difficulty. Um, it becomes in every step, so to speak, easier to recognize what the solution to the problem is. Just acquire something that is more marketable than whatever you have to sell. And that he picks the same type of goods, that is apples in this case, also increases step by step because the more people demand apples to be used for this particular purpose, the more rises the marketability in particular uh, of apples. And so we have very quickly developing some sort of convergence towards one particular good to be selected as a common medium of exchange. More or less everybody in society uses the same good for this particular purpose uh, to facilitate the resaling and atta attaining those things um, that, uh, that he really wants. And this is the definition of a money. Money is defined as a common medium of exchange. Um, now, once we have a common medium of exchange, not only does this problem of double coincidences having to be in existence in order to be able to trade disappear because everybody is now willing to sell everything against this, uh, this money or almost everything against this form of money. So uh, selling and buying becomes much easier. Um, but also, we can now, with the existence of a common medium of exchange that is a good against which all other things are sold and that can be used in order to buy everything else, as soon as a common medium of exchange exists, we can also engage in cost accounting. Remember, cost accounting is the practice that every businessman engages day in and day out in. Um, to compare the input prices uh, with the output prices in order to determine whether he produced efficiently or whether he wasted scarce resources in the production of goods that are less valuable than those things that went into the production of the good. Um, in barter, we have no common denominator for the various inputs and the output. Um, only if we do have a common denominator, that is, um, everything can be expressed in terms of money, uh, are we able to make this type of comparison and the decision we can we produce efficiently, continue what you do because you produce efficiently, you don't produce efficiently, discontinue what you do. This becomes possible as soon as a common medium of exchange is in existence. Um, now a few fundamental insights about the nature of uh, money going beyond what I have uh, so far explained. Um, first of all, uh, economic theory does not predict what commodity will be selected as a medium of exchange, as a common medium of exchange. Um, economic theory can only predict that there are certain characteristics that a good can or cannot have that either increase or decrease the likelihood that it will be chosen. Um, for instance, uh, whatever is chosen as a common medium of exchange uh, 
should have and will likely have the characteristic of divisibility. Um, because we want to make small purchases, large purchases, we want a commodity used as money that can exist in large quantities, small quantities that can be divided into ever smaller units and not lose its fundamental characteristic. That is, it remains still what it was before. Uh, if you divide a tractor uh, and take off the wheels or whatever, it's no longer a tractor. But if you cut an apple into ever smaller pieces, these pieces still remain apple pieces, so to speak. The second thing that should be mentioned is uh, whatever is chosen as a common medium of exchange should be something that is uh, easily portable. That is, uh, people should be, have no difficulty moving it from place to place um, because after all, keep in mind, the purpose of money is to facilitate uh, exchange. So it would be very unlikely, let's say, that, uh, that lead or something like that would be used as money because uh, that is something that is only in large quantities uh, valuable. We want to have something that is even in very small quantities and in lightweight quantities a valuable thing. If lead would be money, then we would, if we want, had to buy a car or so, we would need a truck in order to just uh, take all of our money that we needed to pay for um, uh, for the car. So it is an un, uh, unuseful uh, medium of exchange. Um, it should also be something that is uh, easily recognizable, um, obviously. That is, it should not be too difficult for people to figure out, is that really what the person says um, it is. Now, obviously, many goods fulfill these criteria to a certain extent, some more so and uh, and some less. Uh, you might have seen in some economic textbooks as an example used for the emergence of money, um, the example of prisoners of war camps uh, where people receive care packages and then some of the stuff that they find in the care package they have use for and for other things they have no use for and they would like to exchange that for something else. And then they look again, as I explained, they look for something that is highly marketable uh, in order to acquire these highly marketable goods uh, in order to get what they really want for the things that they want to get uh, rid of. And uh, in the old days, uh, this function uh, of a common medium of exchange was fulfilled by, uh, by cigarettes. Uh, you can see immediately that cigarettes do, to a certain extent, uh, fulfill this requirement. They can be divided up. Uh, you can have cartons, you can have packs, you can have single cigarettes. And as those of you who are smokers know that uh, even if you, uh, happen to me frequently at night, you sit there and don't want to go to the next 7-Eleven, um, and then you go through your ashtray and try to try to uh, then you try to identify which one of your cigarette butts is the longer one, which one is the shorter one, and then you go from the longer ones to the shorter ones. So even on the level of uh, of sub cigarettes, so to speak, there can be uh, quite fine distinctions uh, uh, made. Um, and of course, it is lightweight. Um, and it is easily uh, recognizable. I'm not quite sure if cigarettes would nowadays be uh, still f uh, fulfilling this type of uh, function given uh, the general health craze. Uh, it might now be that if cigarettes are in the package that people just simply throw them all out. Um, and uh, maybe bean sprouts uh, would acquire this, uh, this uh, former status. Um, a second, the second insight is that even though we cannot predict exactly what will be chosen, 
uh, as money, we, we can say that whatever is chosen as a common medium of exchange uh, must be something that was initially a valuable consumer good or producer good traded in barter. Uh, again, recall, the very beginning was precisely the insight, this good has a high degree of marketability. Um, and in reverse, we can say it is impossible that something that is not a commodity, a valuable commodity traded in barter, um, uh, can be chosen as money. Brings me immediately to the question, can fiat money, that is, can pieces of paper function as money from the outset? And the answer is, of course, clearly, no, that cannot possibly be the case. We will see later on how paper money can come into existence, but not at the beginning. The answer why uh, is this. Uh, imagine that uh, uh, you have some valuable good. I would like to have it, but I don't have anything that you would like to have in return. And then I come up with a glorious idea to tear off a piece of paper and then I write ten dollars on it and then I offer you that piece of paper and say here ten dollars how about it um, <laughs> and uh, naturally you would think that I'm a candidate for the loony bin um, but then I uh, increase my offer because I add two zeros to the whole thing <laughs> and uh, raise the question again. In this case, you definitely will call uh, the, lo the local loony bin to, uh, to lock me up. Um, so money must, at the beginning, be a commodity money, something that is also, or was initially, a valuable consumer good or producer good uh, traded, uh, traded in exchange. The next point I want to make is there is an inherent tendency for a universal money to develop. Initially, at the development of money, we can see that there exist various local monies. Uh, the reason, as we saw, was it is advantageous to get engage in division of labor, in exchange, and then out of this there develop, develops a money as a method to facilitate exchange. Now, if different regions begin to trade with each other, and again, the answer, uh, why would people do that, uh, is easy. If different regions begin to trade with each other for exactly the same reason that different individuals within a given region uh, trade with each other, uh, then we are still, as long as we have different types of money being used in one place from another, we are still in a system of partial barter. That is, if I wanted to buy in some other region, it would be necessary that to find first somebody who wants my money uh, and I want his money. That is, a double coincidence of once has to exist at least on this level still. Um, and what happens there, in the same way as this convergence towards one medium of exchange happened in small communities, small regions first, is the same thing. Uh, there will be uh, a selection of uh, a commodity that serves as a common medium of exchange in wider and wider areas. Um, again, if you make your if you make it clear to yourself that the purpose of money is to make exchange as easy as possible, then it should be perfectly clear that, of course, a money that is used on a worldwide scale makes, does precisely this. It makes exchange as easy as it can possibly be. No other money that is only regionally used has the same advantage of facilitating uh, exchange uh, to the utmost degree. A universally used money does precisely this. And historically speaking, we can say that at the moment, roughly speaking, at the moment when the entire world was integrated um, in one giant uh, exchange market, 
parallel to this uh, expansion of an extension of the division of labor, uh, parallel to that also comes into existence uh, an international commodity money, namely uh, the gold standard. Um, so this insight, there is a tendency for money to become an international commodity money. The next point I want to make is um, that in contrast, there exists a fundamental difference between money and consumer goods and producer goods. Um, if you ask the question, what is, so to speak, the best optimal supply of consumer goods? The answer is always, more is always better than less. Uh, if you ask the same question with regard to producer goods, uh, the, question, the answer is always, more producer goods are always better than less producer goods because more producer goods, of course, give rise also to more uh, consumer goods. Um, if we look at money, however, we reach a different conclusion. Um, you might initially say, why isn't that true for money also, that more money is better than less money? But uh, here we can use what Rothbard referred to as the Angel Gabriel model uh, that goes something like this. Imagine that the Angel Gabriel comes down to Earth and wants to help mankind, but he has never taken an economics class. Um, it happens even with angels. Um, uh, he leaves the quantity of consumer goods and producer goods unchanged, but he doubles overnight the amount of money in existence. And then the question is, is society as a whole richer because of this? And the answer is, no, society as a whole is just as rich as before. All that will happen by and large, and I explain why I say by and large in a few minutes, all that will happen is now that the prices of consumer goods and producer goods expressed in this money uh, will by and large double. Uh, but our standard of living depends on the consumer goods uh, and the producer goods in existence. Uh, we don't consume money, we don't produce anything out of money. Money is just a facilitator of exchange. Um, in reverse, if the money supply would fall in half, but again, consumer goods and producer goods would not have been changed as uh, regards their quantity, uh, are we worse off? And the answer is no, we are not worse off. Now what will happen is, by and large, the prices of consumer goods and producer <laughs> goods will, by and large, fall in half. Um, what we have to conclude from this is that once there is a money in existence, once a common medium of exchange has emerged, any quantity of money is equally good as any other quantity of money. More money is not beneficial to mankind, and less money is not detrimental uh, to mankind. Now I have to come to an amendment uh, of this. Um, as a matter of fact, two amendments. The first one is, uh, as long as money is a commodity money, uh, such as gold, we can say, of course, that to the extent that additional quantities of gold are used for non-monetary purposes, filling teeth, making earrings, and so forth, an increase in gold does increase well-being. To the extent that additional quantities of gold are used for monetary purposes, no additional uh, uh, wealth is created in uh, in society. Um, in the case of paper money, where there exists no non-monetary use of it, we can say any increase in the amount of paper money is, so to speak, uh, is something that does not benefit society as a whole at all. The second, more important amendment is, uh, while it is true 
that increases in the supply of money cannot enhance overall uh, well-being in society. It is also true that increases in the supply of money can redistribute income within society. That is to say they can make some people richer and other people poorer. And the reason for this is the following. Just imagine again this Angel Gabriel model. Uh, we find ourselves with having twice as much money as the day before. And just imagine that there are two individuals who react differently upon this discovery. The first person rushes out immediately and spends his additional sums of money. What will then happen? Uh, the goods on which he spends his additional sums of money will begin to rise in price. Um, uh, and you see immediately that, of course, not all goods will immediately rise in price. Those goods on which he spends his money, those will rise in price. Um, and now compare, but this person could initially buy at the old low prices and then drives up the prices of certain goods. Now imagine the other person uh, makes a decision, oh, I wait for four months or so or two weeks and think what I do with all my additional money. And then after two weeks, he goes into the market and begins to buy. What will he find? He will, of course, find that he can no longer buy many goods at the old initial lower prices, but will already have to pay higher prices, prices that are higher precisely because somebody else has already spent his additional sums of money on those particular goods. So if we contrast these two individuals, it should be perfectly clear that that person who spent the money first, rushed out first, gains in wealth at the expense of the person who waited longer. Uh, he could buy at initially low prices. The other one has already has to buy already at various prices that are already higher than they uh, initially were. So there is an income redistribution taking place. And in reality, as you know, of course, increases in the money supply do not occur as in this Angel Gabriel model where we all find ourselves having more money in our wallets uh, than we had the day before. In reality, of course, uh, additional supplies of money come into the hands of particular individuals at particular places. Um, and it is those who get the money first, so to speak, uh, and spend it first, who gain at the expense of those whose income has not yet risen, um, but who have to pay, in the meantime, higher prices, prices driven up by this first person uh, being able to spend more money than before. Um, let me also mention, by the way, um, as some sort of uh, criticism of uh, a guy like Milton Friedman, th that people have, of course, not not an interest in in money that has a stable purchasing power. Um, many economists seem to think that that is the ideal money, a money for that has a purchasing power that allows us to buy the same quantities of goods in the course of time. Um, to see that this argument is clearly faulty, uh, just apply it to other goods. Um, I buy a house. Three things can happen with the house. The price of the house can go up, the price of the house can fall, or the price of the house can stay the same. Then I ask you, what would you prefer? Uh, uh, most people that I have met, maybe except some Chicago economists, would say um, that, of course, we prefer a house that increases in value, um, and only if we can have no increase in the value of the house, then we would say, no, yeah, a house that doesn't lose value, I prefer over a house that does lose uh, value. Now, why should that be different with regard to money? Uh, of course, we prefer a money that increases in purchasing power uh, over a money that is stable in purchasing power. Only if we cannot have a money that increases in purchasing power would we say, okay, I'll take a stable money rather than a money 
that loses uh, value in the course uh, in the course of time. Which brings me to the next insight regarding money. This is not an economic law, but this is an economic regularity. Um, something for which we have uh, historical evidence. As long as mankind is uh, on a commodity money standard, such as a gold standard, the tendency used to be that the purchasing power of money in the course of time did in fact increase. That is, that during much of the 19th century, it happened what we see nowadays only in small sectors of the economy. If you look at elect uh, ele the uh, electronics market, computer market, and so forth, you find that computers are cheaper every year. If you wait another year, you can buy your t computer in a, uh, cheaper than you can d do if you just buy it today. If you wait two more years, it will likely be still cheaper than it is in one year from, uh, from now. Um, prices uh, fall in certain sectors and we also discover by the way that falling prices in certain sectors do not mean that there is no uh, that these firms can no longer make profits um, profits are of course the difference between uh, the input prices that you must pay and the output prices that you collect and if prices in general fall input prices fall and output prices fall that does not affect your profitability uh, at all. During the 19th century under the gold standard this tendency that is now the exception in most cases it is just everything gets more expensive from year to year uh, this tendency that is now the exception was so to speak the general tendency prices tended to fall and uh, to give some very elementary explanation for this in, in growing economies, let's say this rectangle indicates the size of all consumer goods and producer goods. Um, we see that from year to year the quantity of consumer goods and producer goods um, increases. Uh, on the other hand, we have one good, gold, that is used to purchase this sort of stuff. And what happens historically uh, is that there are only teeny additions from year to year made to the existing quantity of gold. If this is the case, that is, this size increases from year to year quite a bit, this size increases just a teeny bit, then if this is expressed in this, the tendency would be uh, for prices um, uh, for prices to, uh, to fall. As I said, this is not a law. Uh, if we would imagine that all of a sudden we find uh, uh, gold in such masses uh, that there would be huge increases here, then we would see, of course, also temporary uh, inflationary tendencies emerging. And you also immediately recognize, of course, that uh, the explanation for the current situation, to which I will come in a second, um, is that if you are under paper money standard, under the pure paper money standard, you can of course increase this size at will. Uh, whereas you can certainly not increase this size at will uh, under a gold standard where you actually have to find, uh, find the stuff. And if you can increase it at will, then of course it is easy to explain why prices expressed in terms of this paper increase all the time instead of, uh, instead of falling. Um, I, I have already uh, difficulties covering all, what I, all that I need to cover. I ask, give me time at the end. Um, so now the question is, um, when we look at the real world, we find the real world looks very different from what we would expect based on theoretical observations. Uh, there is no international... Uh, there's no commodity money in existence. Not a single currency nowadays is a commodity money. Uh, secondly, there is no international uh, currency in existence. We have various competing national paper currencies. Uh, and thirdly, the tendency is not for money to increase in purchasing power, but to decrease in purchasing power. Some countries more, in others less. And how does this come about? And for this, in order to explain this, 
we just have to introduce the institution of government. Uh, in some schools of economic thought, like the public choices, governments are presented as if they were just some sort of firm. Um, but it should be perfectly clear that they are a very unique type of firm. Um, first of all, you can say an institution that funds itself through uh, taxes does not come into existence because there was a demand for it. <laughs> Nobody demands to be taxed. Uh, just as nobody demands to rob me, rob me, rob me, or so. Um, secondly, uh, in contrast to uh, regular firms who do come into existence because there is a demand for their products, um, uh, regular firms also grow because the demand grows. People want to buy more GM cars, so that makes GM grow. Um, and, uh, and people stop buying GM cars and uh, GM goes out of business. Uh, no, governments do not grow because there is more demand for people to be taxed. Uh, and they also do not go out of business if uh, people say, uh, lousy service last year, uh, I would like to discontinue my uh, cooperation uh, with you. So a very different form of, uh, of firm, at least. Um, but governments, uh, being dependent on tax revenue, um, realize that they have the same desire as everybody else. M greater wealth is better than less. More income is better than less income. Uh, but if they try to raise taxes, um, this uh, tends to be a dangerous thing at times. Uh, lots of people have been uh, have experienced chopped off heads as a result of uh, attempts such as this. So they are looking out for a different source of income and this different source of income is trying to gain monopolistic control over the supply of money and all governments basically do that in a three-step process. <laughs> Uh, some governments have done that earlier, others have done that later. Um, the three steps are this. The first one is you monopolize the minting of gold. In the free market, there exist different minters of gold who offer their coins and compete, so to speak, for clients, uh, want clients to use their coins rather than the coins of somebody else. And if you have competition in the minting of gold, this is, of course, one reason to make the producers of gold coins honest. Because if you imagine that somebody says this is an ounce of gold and the competitors would find out that actually it is slightly less than an ounce of gold, there would be, of course, immediately an adver advertising campaign started. These guys are cheating you. Uh, take my coins that are really an ounce of gold and not his coins that say they are an ounce of gold, but actually they are less. Um, governments, by monopolizing this uh, minting, uh, have a far easier way now of in doing precisely what they blame competitors to do, that is to reduce the gold content uh, of gold coins. You recall the gold coins, you remint them, you melt them down, you remint them, you give the same quantity of gold coins back to the people, but you subtract 10% of gold from each coin and the 10% you keep for yourself. This amounts basically to a 10% increase uh, in taxes, but it is less easily uh, discoverable what is going on. But you also realize that this attempt uh, cannot be repeated over and over again because people will catch on to this, um, uh, to this tendency. Uh, the second step that they undertake is this. Uh, under free competition in the gold business, uh, there will not be only gold coins offered by various gold, produ gold uh, minters, but there will be also what is called money substitutes. Um, 
people deposit their gold in banks and receive in return a ticket entitling them to just uh, this piece of gold and they pay a safekeeping, uh, safekeeping fee to the institution that uh, safe keeps uh, gold for them. And these tickets uh, are then accepted after, if people trust the banks uh, as if it was m real money. Uh, this is how paper can come into use because paper in this case is nothing else but a title to something else, a title to a certain quantity of gold stuck somewhere in the bank. People are willing to accept it because they know this is just as good as gold is. All I have to do is just take the ticket and then get, uh, get the gold out. But different banks, so to speak, issue their own uh, papers. Um, government argues now again, yeah, couldn't they just simply print additional pieces of paper not covered by gold? Yes, they could. Uh, but again, it is precisely competition between different banks that makes it very difficult for banks to do this. That is, printing notes, money certificates, which are actually uncovered by gold. Because as soon as one competitor would find out Bank A does that sort of stuff, they would point that out, and then there would be a bank run occurring. Uh, and this possibility pri precisely keeps banks, so to speak, honest. The second step then is the government outlaws the private production of these money certificates and says only I can produce these type of uh, certificates that are redeemable into gold, monopolizing the issue of money substitutes. But again, as soon as it is monopolized, you can see, of course, that now it is much easier to do what governments blamed uh, uh, private producers of money to do. That is, to print additional tickets uncovered by, um, by gold. Um, but if you do this, you do this especially for a while and people catch on to this, then you will encounter eventually bank runs. After all, there are more tickets out there, more ticket owners, then there is gold in the banks. Uh, so bank runs occur, and as soon as bank runs occur, then the third step in the process occurs. That is, from one moment on, the government stops redeeming uh, paper tickets into, uh, into gold as they, initially, uh, as they initially promised. These paper tickets then can float on their own because they have, in the meantime, acquired purchasing power. Uh, the government says, you can keep the paper and we can keep the gold. The gold, you have to keep in mind, of course, is the gold that people have deposited uh, in the banks. And at the same time, they outlaw the private ownership of gold. That is to say, you must deliver your gold to the government and you will be paid generously in form of paper money for it. Um, in United States history, the first step, the monopolizing of the mint, begins with the history of the United States. The second step uh, occurs with, um, um, with the, founding, uh, with the um, uh, founding of the Fed, that is in 1913, the monopolization of uh, money substitutes. The third step uh, stopping redeemability occurs in 1933, 1934. Uh, in this situation, you might think the government has reached, so to speak, uh, the end of the process. That is to say, now they are the only ones that can print paper tickets up. And of course, as you can imagine, if I would just appoint you to be, you are the only person in the country you can print paper money, nobody else can do it, you will, of course, print it. Uh, after all, cost almost nothing to print it. You can buy a Mercedes, BMW, and so forth. You will also find out that you have more friends than you ever thought you had who all come <laughs> running to you and want to make use of this magic wand themselves. Um, but still, there are some problems that remain in existence. If you have different countries that have their own fiat currencies, then if one country inflates more than another country, then 
it is bound that the currency of this country will tend to fall against the currency of another. Now, no government likes to see that this becomes a permanent process. That is, its currency falls all the time against the currency of other countries, because then the danger is that people might simply drop the currency that co continuously falls and adopt the currency that rises in value and that ends this uh, uh, miraculous form of income. Um, so what would be the solution to this? The solution to this is obviously that one has to create a one world currency, one world paper currency, uh, and we are already on the way towards this, uh, creating for instance uh, the uh, euro, um, which reduces the number of currencies already to three major currencies. And if we would have only one world currency, of course, issued by a world central bank, uh, which of course is uh, controlled by the United States, then by definition, uh, this currency can of course no longer fall in the currency market against any other currency and this would be the situation where inflation would reach so to speak its highest uh, its highest uh, levels um, now very quickly to uh, banking um, I already mentioned what is called hundred percent uh, reserve deposit banking. People put their money in the bank, pay a fee for it, do not give up property in the money that they deposit with the bank, um, but must pay a fee for it. Um, and uh, this 100% reserve deposit banking, where you can come at any time you want and redeem your money for, uh, for the ticket, is non-inflationary. Um, that is to say, the amount of money certificates increases every time by the same amount as, as genuine money deposits have been made. And as soon as withdrawals from the bank occur, then gold enters the circulation and the tickets are drawn up. So the composition of money uh, certificates on the one hand and genuine money on the other, the composition of money changes due to depositing and withdrawing, but the total quantity of money does not is not affected by it. And as long as people engage in 100% reserve deposit banking, there is of course uh, no possibility of uh, bank runs. Uh, the second form of banking uh, is that of uh, savings and loan banking. Um, here, people hand over for some time their money to the bank. The, mon the bank becomes the owner, at least temporarily, of this money, then typically loans it out to somebody else, who then becomes temporarily uh, the owner. Uh, and here, the, uh, the savers, uh, do earn an interest, an interest return. Something is being done uh, with their money. Whereas in the 100% uh, reserve deposit banking, uh, of course, the bank is simply held in, uh, the money is simply held in the bank and no interest can then possibly be paid. Um, savings and loan banking also does not involve any increase in the money supply. It's like, I hand over the money to the bank, the bank hangs, hands it over to some investor, and then eventually the money flows back to the uh, initial saver, and the income of the bank consists of the interest differential. Um, that is, the interest that they pay the savers and the interest that they charge to the borrowers. Uh, in contrast, under 100% reserve deposit banking, the interest of the bank, uh, the income of the bank, is uh, the fees, the safekeeping fees uh, that they collect. Um, a savings and loan bank uh, does not have to hold any reserves at all, um, because all they have to do is make sure that at the time when the loans fall due, so to speak, they have the money to be paid out 
to those to whom they have to be paid out. But it is not necessary that they must have any, any reserves. They can loan out all the money that they have. Uh, just make sure that at the time when you have to pay the savers that the loans have been repaid and you can repay um, the saver. And then uh, a hybrid form that is what is called fractional reserve banking. People deposit money in banks um, and uh, uh, receive the right of instant uh, redeemability and at the same time are being paid interest. Now you realize immediately what sort of problems this type of banking form involves. Uh, you can only receive interest if some of the money that you deposit has been in fact loaned out to somebody. Um, otherwise it would be impossible to pay the depositor any interest. On the other hand, you have the right to have your notes instantly redeemed. Um, but both of these things are actually impossible to do. Um, fractional reserve banking implies that more tickets have been brought into existence than gold to back up these tickets. That is, fractional reserve banks are always inherently bankrupt. If all ticket owners would come at the same time, a bank would be, um, uh, it would be impossible for the bank to redeem all notes um, into, um, into gold. Um, from a legal point of view, what fractional reserve banks do is they create, so to speak, multiple owners of the same piece of property. Um, I deposit a piece of gold and get a certificate. And because banks know that not all certificate owners will come at the same time and want to have their certificates <coughs> redeemed, they have created certificates looking like other certificates except there is no gold for it um, available. In other words, there exist multiple certificate owners who claim, so to speak, ownership of the same quantity of gold sitting uh, in the bank. And as you can imagine, if you have two owners who claim to be at the same time the exclusive owner of one piece of property, conflicts must arise. And these conflicts, of course, become revealed precisely in the bank run when not everyone can be paid, but whoever comes first is paid, whoever comes later um, is not paid at all. And the economic consequence of uh, fractional reserve banking um, is uh, the business cycle. Um, because if you create additional pieces of paper money uncovered by any gold, uh, this will lower the interest rate below and, uh, and uh, channel, channel this into the credit market. This will lower the interest rate below what it otherwise would have been. Uh, businessmen will begin a larger amount of uh, investment projects uh, than otherwise would be the case due to the fact that interest rates uh, are lower, but in fact, no additional savings has taken place. That is, the credit that has been given to the businessmen is what is called fiduciary credit rather than what is called commodity credit. A genuine saver abstains from consumption and puts the, bank, puts the money in a bank for a while and what he abstains from consuming can be used, so to speak, uh, in order to feed the workers that are working on additional investment projects. These investment projects that are financed by commodity credit can be finished, can be completed. In the case of fractional reserve banking, again, credit is given, uh, additional credit is given to uh, business, businessmen um, but 
This is credit that has been created out of thin air. That is, it is not backed by additional savings. So the commodities that a normal saver abstains from using are actually not available to those who receive this paper money credit. And we have then an, a volume of investment going on that is in the long run unsustainable due to the fact that uh, the necessary savings in order to feed the workers during the period which is necessary in order to complete the investment projects uh, are lacking. So with this I end. Thank you very much. Um,